What is up, everybody, and welcome to the All NBA Show, part of the All City Podcast Network. I'm your host, Adam Mares. I'm joined by my esteemed colleague, Tim Legler. Legs, we've been waiting for this, it feels like, for six weeks. The playoffs <laughs> have finally get set. Uh, yeah. It's happened. How are you feeling? Yeah. Such a relief. <laughs> relief. That's the only way I can describe it. Because one thing I don't like are, are discussing hypotheticals. Same. I mean, that's like even in life, even in life, like my mind, I, I don't have time for hypotheticals. I just don't give me something concrete. I'll give you a very strong opinion on it one way or another. So all these hypotheticals leading up to this and it got into yesterday, Adam, going into the day, right? Everybody playing uh, 15 different seating positions up for grabs. Uh, Boston's the only one I think that had it locked in, if I'm not mistaken, maybe the Clippers and Dallas as well. But um and so I was like, well, am I going to sit there literally and live and die with every one of these games? No, I'm not. I'm going to wait till the smoke clears around 7 o'clock and see who's playing who. And now we know, and we have concrete games to talk about. So from an analytical standpoint, I'm very grateful we're here. Me as well. And even you were talking about the tank or the tankathon, the non-playoff teams. All of those games mattered too for seeding. And we yeah. even got one of the most ridiculous games ever. What was it, Charlotte? Who was it Charlotte was playing, trying both teams trying to lose as desperately as they can and made for a weird weekend. I was actually disappointed, though, to be honest with you in the weekend. I don't know how you felt, but some of these games I was expecting, especially Sunday, you see the slate and you're like, OK, that's going to be a great Sunday. But really, only a couple of the games mattered, in particular, the Wolf Suns and then the Lakers Pelicans, both of them blowouts. So like the only games that really carried a lot of weight, neither one of them was all that that entertaining. Well, you're talking about in terms of the games that had two like good teams playing right. each other. You're right. You're right. That didn't materialize because I could like I would say like, you know, the Knicks game carried a yeah. lot of weight, you know, and it was an overtime game. And we'll get into that more like did what exactly is the reward for that? And what that's what that's going to look like, but they were all in five straight to end the season, including overtime, clawing their way out of a ten point fourth quarter deficit yep. to to get to overtime, then winning the game in overtime, and and what does that result in? Well, they're the two seed, so you know the first two rounds they will have home court advantage, assuming that they're there for two rounds. So and that's a great yep. thing, but it could totally change who you play. And I think the same thing happened in the West with who these teams gonna are going to end up playing based on where they finished. And that's what made this year so hard, Adam, because you you know, you know want to avoid certain teams. Clearly in the East, the main team was Boston. You'd have to worry about that. You knew where they were at. Like, that's an easy one. Okay, if we want to avoid them, then let's just not finish four, five, or eight, and we're good. In the West, it was harder because Denver's the team, but they occupied all three spots at the top yeah. of the West in a 48-hour period. So yeah. it was like – it reminded me of – when you go to Sixers games, and a lot of arenas do this, but like at Sixers games, I go there a lot. They, they'll do this shell game, like on the big screen. They'll bring some kid out, and they'll do the shell game. It's like a little basketball, and it goes underneath the three shells. They yeah. move around. The kid okay, that's what this was. It was a shell yeah. game by the Nuggets. Like, where are they at? One, two, or three? Because they were in all three spots at some point. And, and so that's what made it a lot harder in the West in terms of avoiding them because you didn't know where they were going to land. And obviously – now the Lakers find themselves in an interesting situation as a result. Yeah, we're going to get into all that in our first segment. Talk about was it good or bad, some of the outcomes for some of these teams uh, coming into this week. We're also going to talk about who has the best and most difficult paths in the playoffs. And then later on, we're going to talk about who has the most pressure and what's the most memorable thing from the season. So it should be a packed show for you. Lots to get to. All NBA is sponsored by DraftKings. Stay tuned because you'll hear more about DraftKings and all it has to offer throughout the show. DraftKings, the crown is yours. All right, let's get into the very first one. We alluded to it at the top. On Friday, the Nuggets get, first of all, they're up 23 points in the second half against the San Antonio Spurs. Then they collapse all the way down to the final two seconds where Devontae Graham hits a go-ahead bucket. They were in the one seed. They controlled their own destiny and they played two tanking teams. 
but they dropped to San Antonio and it dropped them all the way down to third. It felt like an absolute disaster, a fumbling of a great opportunity. But then on Sunday, they get the win at Memphis and Minnesota falls to the Spurs. So they move up to the two seed now. The Wolves fall to the three seed. Um, but the Nuggets still lost the one seed. So I have to ask you overall, was it a good thing or a bad thing that the Nuggets fall to the two seed? As it turned out, I think it's going to be a good thing because it's related to who I think is a big threat out West. And you know, I think that's Dallas. So you've basically eliminated the ability to have to play them in that second round, which I, which is what I was worried for Dallas's sake. Was that going to be the case? Like, cause I think Dallas yeah. could make a run to the conference finals. I kept saying, as long as they avoid Denver, I kept, that was my, that was my caveat with, with that, with any team in the West. And, and that's what happened. And I think then for Denver, it's probably also a good thing. I mean, the only, the only way it could be bad for them, and I don't know anybody that thinks this, but if somebody out there thinks the Oklahoma City Thunder are winning two rounds, and even then, look, it's the Nuggets, man. Like, they're not going to fear anybody, but I'm just saying, and that's the only case in which they wouldn't have home court advantage in the conference finals. And I think most people think Oklahoma City won't be there by the time the Nuggets get to the conference finals. That means they will host the conference finals and avoid Dallas until, until they get there. So in that way, I think it worked out pretty well for the Nuggets. I think so too, for the reason you just stated, they did take out one team in the in the Dallas Mavericks that they would have to avoid later. I do want to give some love to Oklahoma City. Even when you're a one seed or typical one seed, not like Boston is an, is, is an outlier one seed, but when you're one game better than the two and the three seed, it's still, even if a team believes in you, like let's take the Denver Nuggets, they're a two seed. Their odds of making the conference finals are probably 50% or below. And it's not because you think, oh, some other team has better odds. It's just that they have to win two rounds. Winning two rounds in the playoffs is always hard. So every team has like below is less likely than not to make it to the conference finals. So that being said, they have a shot to do it, but I'm with you. They're going to have to go through Dallas. They're going to have to maybe go through the Lakers or Warriors or Pelicans. So it is a tough path for them. And Denver might end up being the number one seed outright anyway, or be having home court all the way through the finals anyway. Mm -hmm. So I think it worked out for them. Where it didn't work out for them, though, the second round against the Timberwolves or the Suns, I actually think both of those teams are a tough matchup for them. Um, again, Denver will probably be favored against either one, especially with home court advantage. But that's no cakewalk. And so I think I agree with you, but I think it's marginal. Like, you're right, Dallas would have been tough. Avoiding them is good. But it's not like they got a cakewalk path. They still might have a tough first round and a tough second round. No, I completely agree with that. And I don't think it's some – in my mind, it's clear that Dallas represents a bigger threat than those two teams. But really but that's, that that's an opinion for me, right? And I, I'm basing it on just what I'm seeing and how, what I believe in. And, and that's what I think a lot of people disagree with that. So, you know, it's going to be interesting to see, all, you know, all these people out there jump on my bandwagon, which is going to be fine. There's yeah. plenty of room. I got a lot of room in the wagon for people to jump on the Mavericks. You know, I've been on this team yeah. for a while now. And so in my mind, yeah, I think that, I think that it's clear. You said it's a marginal difference between Minnesota Phoenix and Dallas, um, I think is a little bit more than that. I think I think Dallas, because of their elite guard play at the lead position in Luca and the what he has shown he's capable of in pressure situations and the way that he can just control games and then Kyrie playing at the the best he's played alongside of him, um, he, he's a he's a massive X factor in this. I think Dallas represents a little bit more than a marginal. Uh, increase in your opponent for Denver. So I think that they, I think it worked out well for them. It worked out well for Dallas. And look, they got to beat the Clippers first. A lot of people are probably going to pick the Clippers to win that series, and that's fine. They have home court advantage in that series against against Dallas. Um, and we'll see. That might be split down the middle on how people pick that to go. Maybe it will be the Clippers that move on. Um, and if that's the case, then if the Clippers get by Dallas, then the Clippers, to me, will represent the biggest threat to the Denver Nuggets because that means they just knocked off the team that I really believed in. And there's a reason for that. A little bit more so for me than Minnesota and Phoenix. I know Phoenix is hot right now. They're playing well. But th there's an awful lot that I, I, they're going to have to erase from my memory before I'm going to buy in on them. The Minnesota is an interesting one, Adam, just because, you know, t Towns just coming back, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a big piece to sort of throw in now as you're trying to figure out a way to play against a pretty high powered team in Phoenix. So that's an interesting dynamic for them and their defense and their size against Phoenix's high powered offense is going to be interesting. 
Well, let me throw you a curveball because I didn't prep you for this one, but it does raise another interesting question. Is it good thing or bad thing that Carl Anthony Towns is back, given that he's only been able to play a handful of minutes before now you're going to go match up against a team that likes to exploit big men, <laughs> that likes to try to draw the big men out? So is it a good thing or bad thing that he's back, in your opinion? All in all, I'm going to say a good thing because it, it's just another – it's more depth of a high-level player because he is a high level player and he's super skilled and look, you, you know, if he's just, just say he's taken out of the equation and you go into this series, you're, you're banking heavily on Anthony Edwards having to outplay either Durant or Booker or both for oh. them to have a chance. Right. And that's, that's a lot, man. That's a lot. He doesn't have a lot of playoff experience under his belt. Where else is it going to come from that? You know, for sure. And we don't know that that's the one thing about towns. He is capable of doing that. I mean, the dude can flat out score. It gives you another option. So I, I, I'm of the belief, I don't know if I've ever said a team was worse off getting back an all-star caliber player like right at, at, at the end here, close to the playoffs. Yeah. I, you know, or because you're worried about disrupting flow and rhythm and whatever else you're worried about. I don't know, man. I always look at it like, nah, give me another high-level player, a guy that can score because you're going to need it in a playoff series against Phoenix. So I, I don't think ultimately, no. I know there's some people out there that's the popular line of thinking. Even the way Nas Reed has played has made people right. think that. But I don't, you know, we're better off with not Nas Reed. But be careful what you wish for, man. Uh, give me another dude that's capable of having a 20 to 30 point game in a playoff game. I'll take that. I think knowing who you are is just so important. And this Wolves team, there's one thing, you know, there's a little like they've lost momentum at the last little bit of the season, in large part because of the injury. But – you were the one seed for most of the year. Now you're the three seed. You've played well against a bunch of teams. Now you play a team you're 0-3 against in the Suns. You play them in the playoffs. And now to have to reestablish, okay, well, we get into a playoffs. You know, what does the rotation look like? How do you close? You get into a tight game, and now there's a little bit of, well, we've had some success this way or that way. That's the only reason I think it could be a bad thing. And, it, and I don't think I would feel this way if it weren't for the specific matchup that I think even if Towns never got hurt, there would be a little bit of a question if you were facing the Phoenix Suns with how do we yeah. attack this team? How do we close? Because they go small, they spread you out, they have great shooters. So do you play those two bigs? Can we take advantage of it? The fact that at this very moment, I just don't know if that's a strength or a weakness for the, yeah. for the Wolves. That's why I think this specific one I could see being, again, it's hard to say bad thing, but a complication. Hardest series for me to pick. Of of yeah. all of the, the ones Real, that we know for sure, and even and even looking at the hypotheticals, like even if you want to assume, you know, let, let's just assume Lakers win, okay? You know, I, I, then we know that matchup, or let's assume New Orleans wins. I know what that matchup is going to be the two seven. I, I I easily easy to pick that for me. Then you get to the eight. Let's just say it's either Lakers or Warriors against the one seed. I think I'd feel confident how I'd pick, depending on who the Thunder were playing. I feel the same way about the Eastern Conference. That series, Phoenix, Minnesota, is the hardest one for me. That's the hardest one for me to pick. Because you're wow. talking about what you ultimately believe in the most. And look, Phoenix is playing well now. And that might be too much for Minnesota. If Booker and Durant and then Beal you know, kind of chips in, he doesn't have to be great the whole series. If Booker and Durant are... And then Beal is just good enough when he has to be. And, you know, and, and they make enough threes. Is that offense going to be too much to overcome what the Wolves rest their head on, which is their defensive and deployed, their prowess, their size, like right? what they can do to jam you up. Does the pace of the game slow to the point that that affects Phoenix offensively? I'm just not sure yet how that's going to go. I don't, you know, I'm not going to really predict that series yet because I don't have to. I'm going to yeah. wait a little bit on that one and see how this week plays out with Towns and whatnot, and more information. And then right before whenever they play Saturday or Sunday, I'll, I'll make that pick on that series. I don't have to yet, and I'm glad because that's a hard one. Well, what the series will also have is a little bit of bad blood. I don't know if you saw in the game yesterday, but, you know, Bradley Beal, Carl Anthony Towns, Anthony Edwards, they were kind of chirping throughout the game. I, I felt like the Suns feel very confident in that matchup, and we're trying to let them know. And I actually think it got under the Timberwolves' skin a little bit. So that'll be a series that has some bad blood, that has obviously the regular season history, Suns going 3-0. and I think that'll be interesting. Let's move on to the Knicks, though. The Knicks get an overtime win over the Chicago Bulls, 120-119, to and they, as a reward... They get the two seed and will play, face the winner of the 76ers in the Heat play-in game. I think that's going to be the 76ers. But 
They won the two seed when it looked like everybody else, the Bucks, who dropped to Orlando, only scored 88 points uh, in Cleveland, were trying to avoid, it seemed, the two seed. So the Knicks win the two seed. Yeah. Is that a good thing? Yeah, it's, it's you know, it, well, look, we don't know what's going to happen in the 7-8. And either way, you know, Philly or Miami, like that's the, that's the reward you're going to get. As opposed to finishing third, you know you're getting the Pacers. And look, I personally think I'm higher on the Pacers than a lot of people. And I I think they can beat Milwaukee, even if Giannis were healthy. I think that's a dangerous series for the Bucs. I got, even if Milwaukee were to win that series, if Giannis plays and he's 100%, which I don't know if that's even possible to be 100%, but let's just say he's really effective. He's a, he's a you know a good version of Giannis. I think that could take seven games to beat Indiana. Without him or with him limited, I think Indiana can win that series. But that's what you would have got if you're the Knicks. You would have got that. You would have got the, the Pacers as opposed to, wow, a team in Philly just got him beat back. They they run out the string after he comes back. Um, and then Miami, which I, you know, both of us, I think, kind of feel the same way about Miami this year. I just don't really see this happening for them, like one of these runs. It's still the heat, man. It's still Eric Spoltra. So for the Knicks, I got to think, no, it didn't work out too advantageously to finish two and you get either Sixers or Heat as opposed to Indiana. Would you be in favor? The way you solve this, right, is because I think the 76ers are one of the toughest teams you could face out of all of the Eastern Conference teams. They're one of the toughest. Would you have it to where the top seeds just get to pick who they play? I mean, <laughs> there's drawbacks to that. Then the coach, you know, you, the coach has to make a decision. It riles up the other team. It's bulletin board material. But at least if you were the Knicks, you probably would not pick the 76ers. You would pick one of these other teams. Well, wait a second, though. No, you can't, obviously, because all right. Let's just run that scenario out. Let's just say, let's say, Boston gets the pick. Uh, yeah, let's just say Philadelphia and Miami are the last two teams in, and they're seven okay. and eight. Philly seven and Miami eight, whatever. Yeah. So you're saying the Celtics can pick any team they want? I'd say any team below five, five, six, okay, seven, eight. Okay, you get to okay. pick a lower seed. All right. So you could, you could go. Yeah, but here's the thing. Let's say they, let's say they, they pick the yeah. Magic. Yeah. We want the, we want the magic at five. Well, okay. who does Cleveland play? Now Cleveland gets Well, they shafted. get the last pick. They get the last pick. So then the Knicks get to pick. Now the Knicks say, okay, Orlando's off the board. We got three teams to pick from. Yeah, but that's my point because then Orlando would end up with the toughest of those teams that everybody would agree on, and, and they finished fourth, and they're supposed to play the magic. I see. So somebody gets screwed no matter what you do. Somebody gets screwed. Yeah, like if you did it that way, then it ends up the last team to be picked is Philly because they're scared of Philly a little bit with the beat. And Cleveland's like, well, wait a second. We're not supposed to play them. You know, it's yeah. like you, yeah. you get that. Scenario. No, but I hear what you're saying. Like, I don't know yeah. that there is a solution to this. And it, it's more than we've ever seen this yeah. tightly bunched together with this yeah. many tiebreakers that you're looking at going into these last couple days of the season. There's it's impossible. That's why, look, it always gets back to the same thing, man. Just play and win. Play and win as much as you can. Let the chips yeah. fall where they may. And yeah. I think that's that's what maybe your best your best logic is. When you start to manipulate it based on worrying about who you're playing, I just it seems like bad things can happen to you. I think that both the Pelicans and the Lakers are an interesting matchup against the Oklahoma City Thunder. And I think both of them, it would be a tough matchup to face the Denver Nuggets. So they play each other in the 7-8. Is it possible that the best thing is going to be to lose that first play-in game and have a shot at playing for that last spot and getting a Oklahoma City Thunder? Well, that, there's a lot of talk about that this morning, right? It, like, Does that make sense? And it's, only, it's interesting because they're only coming at it because they're just a more interesting team in terms of national conversation from a Lakers perspective. People are wondering. Well, if you're Lakers, just don't play anybody. Yeah. Just lose that game. Concede the game so you don't have to play Denver in the first round. And I say, okay, here's the problem with that. One, one, let's say that the Pelicans have the same idea. <laughs> so so what, is that, what does that game look like? You've got none of the starters playing. you got a bunch yeah. of reserves. And by the way, Normally, like if you just sat your guys, you're expecting your reserves to lose to that team. Just go play basketball, guys. We're just not going to be as, as good as them. Well, if you have two sets of reserves out there, now you're looking at it like, and they're not allowed to play well. What exactly does that game look like? And I think the league. I'll tell you what it looks like. 
I'll Sorry, tell you what it looks like. It looks like the Hornets Cavs game from last night, which was 120 <laughs> to 110 the Hornets, because both teams were trying to lose. And right. Nick Smith Jr. was the leading scorer in the game. So go. that's what it would that's look what, like. That's that's what we would get. But this would be, but it would be different because it's an actual, like, I guess, you know, quote, playoff game. Sort of the league would be really interested in, in that scenario. Okay. Now, let's just say though. Let's just say you look at it from just the Lakers' perspective. If the Pelicans aren't aren't going to do this, and they're going to Lakers going to concede the game. Pelicans will take that game. Now the Pelicans will go play Denver, right? Well, here's what you've done though. If you're the Lakers, you now have reduced your entire chances at playing in a seven game series to one game, and it's the winner of the, the Warriors Kings. Let's just say it's the Warriors. So now you got LeBron James versus Steph Curry. One of them's going home. One of them's moving on, and all of a sudden, man. Anthony Davis has a back spasm. Somebody yeah. rolls an ankle. Somebody gets in foul trouble. Uh, somebody, D'Angelo Russell goes one for 14. You know, just does can't throw one in the ocean or whatever. And now all of a sudden, you don't even get a shot at a best of seven because you put all of your eggs in this one game that you have to win. And I think that's a dangerous thing to do, man. And, and look, some people might say, well, what difference does it make? If they go home after playing two games like that and they lose both games and they go home, or playing four against Denver or five against Denver going home, what's the difference? Well, I don't know. It's LeBron James and Anthony Davis, man. That's the difference. In a best of seven, I don't think they'd beat Denver, but I would think they've got the they've got the, the cachet to think they could go toe to toe with them and play with them. You yeah. know, so that's what I, that's all I'm saying, man. It's a dangerous scenario to put yourself in where you intentionally give a game up when you're going to now put your entire chances of playing in a best of seven on one game. Now, some people might be totally in agreement, tank it. You'll beat that team, whoever that is, and you'll play the Oklahoma City Thunder at best of seven and avoid the Denver Nuggets as long as you possibly can. Why wouldn't you do that? And I think there are people out there that are going to be building up that between now and tomorrow night. Let me phrase it this way. You're the head coach of the LA Lakers and your job is on the line. Front office comes down and says, you have to make the second round uh -huh. or you're fired. You have two choices. You could either go right into a series with the Denver Nuggets, or you could go right into the second play-in game where if you lose, you're out, but if you win, you get the, the thunder. So in that scenario, you're the coach. You have to make the second round. It's second round or bust. Which scenario do you think gives you the best odds? Yeah, look, it, I hear you. It, you're 100% right. But here's the other problem. That conversation, because we were talking about this today. Okay, so let's just say that, that that's kind of in the air. Yeah. And there's got to be an initial conversation had internally. Okay? So who do you think has to be the one to kind of bring that up first? I think like it has who, to be LeBron James. Okay. Oh, I see what, what you mean. It has to be his what idea. If, what, if what if you're Darvin Ham? Yeah. You're okay? Right. What if you're Darvin Ham? You're Rob Palenka? Right. What, what and you guys... You guys kind of talk it out, and then it's like it's like it's like you come up with an idea to, to a way to make some money that's illegal, okay? And uh, and you got this great idea, and you come to me, but you don't know if I'm on board with that, <laughs> okay? Right. Well, you've now exposed yourself yeah. to some problems, right? It's the same thing here. So if you're Darvin Ham and, and you're even thinking that way, and you be and you're the one that broaches the subject, and LeBron's like, man. You're tripping. What are you talking about, man? We're yeah. going to go win some games. Like now you have really subjected yourself to it. Yeah. So that's what's very interesting about this. Where does the conversation begin? And, and and how far does it go? And who's involved in the conversation? And who initiates it? I personally, maybe I'm naive, man. I think they show up, they play, they try to win the game. And then they move on to give themselves, they give themselves two chances by playing hard to win one game and get into the postseason. Hey, maybe they play hard and lose. That's the best case scenario. Play, everyone plays, show up, play hard, lose a close game late, no problem. Now let's go beat the Warriors or the Kings and we get the Thunder. That's the best case scenario because no one's lo looking at you as like you're ducking and dodging people. But it's no question it's more advantageous to play the Thunder. It's just how do you get there, man, and do it where you're not like really kind of questioning the fabric of what you're all about there you go all right let's take a break on the other side we got to get into this who has the best and worst draws from the playoffs i do think there are some real winners and some real losers to be had so we're going to get into that and then later on in the show of course we're going to talk about who has the most pressure going into the playoffs all that and more so stay tuned hit that like button for us if you're watching live hit the subscribe button if you're new you're not going to want to miss it as we break down this uh with this hour-long show four days a week first let me tell you about ag1 what I have done, you might notice I'm starting to get 
into summer form, trying to get my summer look going. So I've replaced my coffee and my coffee uh, sort of habit in the mornings with AG1. Why? Because it, they've got all the uh, multivitamins, nutrients, and superfoods, adaptogens, and probiotics that you need to have a great start to your day. It's delicious and easy to make. Just one scoop into the little container that they give you. Mix in some water, shake a little bit. I add a little bit of ice, and then it's ready to go. And you know you're getting your day started off really nicely. It's a foundational nutrition supplement. It really is a one and all, get all of those vitamins and probiotics and everything you need for great gut health to start your day. AG1 is a supplement I trust to provide the support for my body and get all of my daily needs. And what I'm excited is to welcome them as a new partner. If you wanna take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1, try AG1 and get a free one year supply of vitamin D3K2 and five free AG1 travel packs. I like the travel packs, they just come in a little thing you can put in your backpack. So if you're on the go, it just open, put it in a cup of water, stir, and you're good to go. You get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3, K2, and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase exclusively at drinkag1.com slash allmba. That's drinkag1.com slash allmba. Check it out. Also, I want to tell you about our presenting sponsor, DraftKings. The 82-game preseason is in the books. That really is what the regular season has become. It's become the an 82-game exhibition. But it's in the books, and it's timely, finally time for the real season. Don't miss out on any of the playoff action at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. From the play-in through the finals, DraftKings Sportsbook has you covered with same-game parlays, live betting, odds boosts, and so much more. We're going to have a special betting episode later on in the week to help you bet this playoffs. How many games are series going to go? Who's going to win? Who's going to be the best player? We'll have all of that, so stay, uh, stay tuned for that. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code ALLNBA. New customers bet $5 and get... 200 in bonus bets instantly. That's right. This is a new deal. They bumped it up. You bet five bucks, you get 200 in bonus bets instantly. That's code all NBA only at DraftKings. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1 800 Gambler. Or in West Virginia, visit 1 800 Gambler.net. In New York, call 877 8 Hope NY or text Hope NY 467 369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888 789 7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas, 21 and over, age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. See dkng.co slash bball for eligibility and deposit restrictions, terms, and responsible gaming resources. All right, back here, segment two. I'm Adam Montes. He is Tim Legler. Legs, let's start to break it down. Who do you think, now that the dust has settled, at least as much as it can be with these playing games going, who do you think got the best draw relative to what their expectations should be? So a team, you know, if you were expected to lose in the first round, maybe you got bumped up to where you should expect to win. Relative to expectation, who do you think got the best draw? I would say probably uh, Milwaukee, I think, got a good draw. Really? Rel I thought you well, just picked them to lose. No, but, well, here's the thing. Relative to the other teams they could have played, I'm saying, like, it, it, this, oh, is a team that, yeah. this is a team that's got ch – if they don't have champion, they might not have championship expectations now, according to us. Oof. But I'm sorry, but that's who you put together. You're expecting to win a title, and if you don't, it's a massive failure. So what? what's the best path to take? You think about what you're going to have to do. You get home court against a six seed, even though, yeah. like I said, I personally think Indiana can beat them. I I, I don't think that'll be the majority opinion. Do you, I mean, would you pick the Pacers to beat the Bucks? Yeah, I think I would. I just don't like. I don't like what I've seen from the Bucks over the last. I don't two, think three enough. Weeks. I don't think enough people know enough about the Pacers nationally to make that pick. Could be. You, you and I. Are, you and I are watching all these games every night. A lot of people aren't paying attention to the Indiana Pacers. So I think the consensus is going to be the Bucs win that series. If Giannis is healthy and plays, is not limited in any way. I think a lot. Of, and then after that, you know, you, 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 well, I mean, it depends. We think about Nick's Philly, but I'm just, I don't see mm -hmm. for a team that's expected to win a title, right? And, and who you're going to have to play to ultimately get there against Boston, I don't think it's, I don't think it's terrible. They would have to really come together in a way that you don't expect, but you are right that there's a runway. And then there's the Giannis part that looms over all of this. I mean, if Giannis isn't healthy, you know, throw everything else out because not only is it obviously they need him to go far in the playoffs, yeah. but I even think there's an emotional just drag on a team. If it comes out this week, hey, he's just not going to be 100% or you watch him play and you're like, yeah, that's not Giannis. That, that, that's a, a shell of Giannis. There's an emotional letdown there that I think will just be so tough. So I – personally wouldn't have picked them 
But I understand the logic of what you're saying is they avoided the the 76ers, which I think would have been a disaster. I, For me, the first team that came to mind was the Phoenix Suns. And this is how high I am on their matchup with, uh, with the Timberwolves. I think they could have, similar to what you just said about Milwaukee, if you just go to the other matchups they could have drawn, a Dallas or, or a Denver or what have you, I think it would have been much tougher. But they are 3-0 and against Minnesota. I think that I saw a stat that says they have not been within uh, – the Timberwolves have not been within 10 points in any of the three games in the second half. In the second half of games, they've all been blowouts. So I look at the Phoenix Suns and I say, all right, they got a, the best first-round matchup they could get. You get into a two – you know, the second round, you have to play the Nuggets. That's tough. But okay, I still think that that matchup is okay for them. So I think the Phoenix Suns, to me, are a big winner given that they are a six seed. Well, based on – okay, so that's different, I guess, than how I was looking at it. You're just talking about winning a round because, to me, well, I don't know how I don't know how I could describe a team as having a good path if they got run into the Nuggets in the second round. Like, that that's where it's going to come to an end. You have you know, you had to try to avoid them at all costs. Um, I think in a lot of ways – twice in Denver this year, though. I think Dallas – actually, now I think about it, Dallas might have a pretty good path, too, because the Clippers – Clippers haven't been very good over the last six weeks. Yeah. And you've really come together. And then potentially coming out of that, you might get the Thunder right. in the second round before you get to the Nuggets. So I am look. I was looking at it more like that second round matchup, like what that would yeah. look like to, to, to extend your season as long as possible. I think you're probably right as far as the first round for Phoenix to get them as opposed to who else they, they look like they were likely to get at one point. Yeah, I agree with that. I just with with Phoenix, if you're a lower seed, you're gonna run into a tough team eventually. There's just no avoiding yeah. it. And the fact that they get one where they should be somewhat favorable, at least in the matchup, is good. And then, like I said, I don't I don't count them out against Denver should they make it to the second round. I'm 100 percent with you on Dallas, though. Look, that second round matchup with what what we think will be the Thunder, uh, could be the Pelicans, could be the Warriors, you know, depending on it, could be the Lakers even. I think it's a favorable like second round, but I think that first round. It's so interesting. You're right that the Clippers inspire no confidence, but they do have Kawhi Leonard. They do have James yep. Harden. They do have Paul Dr They do have talent. And so I think that – is there any world where you see that first round being significantly more difficult for Dallas specifically than – I almost feel like everyone's just writing them into the second round. Yeah, I think yeah, because they're hot, they got momentum, they – they, you know, they finished the year so strong. Luca was so great late. Kyrie was great. I, I just think people are kind of riding that. And the Clippers, look, if the Clippers, you know, had a nice winning streak going or they, you know, won 10 out of 12 coming in, I, I no, I think a lot of people would pick the Clippers to win that because of how they looked at one point earlier this year. They looked like the best team in the West besides Denver at one point. And that's a while ago, though. People have forgotten about it. So now as they get ready to enter into this, I just think they people view Dallas as playing at so much of a higher level than the Clippers. But the truth is, it can all come together quickly for a team like the Clippers, man, with that level of talent. And with a player like Kawhi Leonard, you know, kind of matching the control on the other end that Luka's going to give them, there's no doubt that's going to be a very difficult series, man. That, like, But that, that this is where I'll say, normally if I pick a lower-seeded team, and they say, of course, how many games? That's the next question. Right. I usually will have to say, well, you got you know six or less probably because – you don't think a game seven, seven on the road is like is going, but in that case, I would have a lot of faith in Luka Doncic in a game seven on the road. So I don't know if that goes six or seven. It goes more than five. I think ultimately Dallas wins. But hey, look, man, you're talking about tight games. They they can go either way. It, would it be would I be shocked if the Clippers won that series? I would not be. But mm -hmm. I I'm picking I'm picking Dallas to win that series just based on what I've seen over the last month. I see this comment from Volta Volta Dumar. He says Mavericks would smoke OKC, and then people would go, "Luca has a stacked team." And I'm telling you from experience, this is exactly what happens. No, it, it's true. Legs. Last year, the narrative was Denver does not want the Lakers. They're going to get. They're going to lose in the first round. They don't want the Suns. And then Denver beat those teams, and the narrative became they played no one. So. I'm telling Mavs fans right now, because Mavs fans really do remind me of Nuggets fans from the last couple of years. You go through it. There's no relief. Whatever you think, you think, oh, we just proved all the doubters wrong. They just come up with a new narrative to, to spin it. So prepare yourself for that accordingly. Um, <laughs> I, think, I think the Magic got a good draw. And here's why. They are a team that should not expect to go. I, I, I mean, by all coming into the year, even coming into like the last week, you wouldn't pick the Magic to win a round. 
I think getting the Cavs, who have really not looked great for the last 20 games or so, I think getting them, even though you're a lower seed, is actually a good scenario for them. If they win one round, yes, you get Boston in the second round, but that's such a good foundation for a young team to say, hey, we won a playoff series. Now we're going up against the number one team. We get that experience. I think they got the best draw to do that. Totally agree with you. And, and look, this isn't this isn't a knock. We've been very uh, um, high on our praise for the Orlando Magic all year. We have been. I mean, it's, I, yeah. not so much for me early in the season, but since like literally like mid December, man, it's been pretty much steady praise and and just salute to them for staying in the mix the entire time. I will say this: there's probably right less interest in that series than any in the first round by far. Yeah. And that I think my point being. I think that could actually help a team like Orlando, hmm. right? Because now it's just it's just show play basketball. There, nobody's going to be really breaking these games down besides us after the <laughs> Magic and Cavaliers games. I can tell yeah. you that. So I think that actually might be helpful to them. Now, you know, they're they're young, man. They don't have any collective experience here in dealing with these situations. But I've been very impressed the way they played, and I'm very impressed with in in the playoffs. When your defense shows up every night, you give yourself a chance because there's going to be guys that have rough shooting nights in the playoffs. It happens in every single series. Then if your defense can be what overcomes that, and that's true about the Magic. Yeah. And then the teams that got the bad draw, for me, I think number one is easily the Timberwolves. Getting the one team that has not just beat you, but beat you down 3-0 throughout the season – I think that's a really tough matchup. And then to say you have to go to Denver in the next round, look, they're designed to beat Denver. But to go on the road to have to do that makes it harder. So I think for them, let's say they win a championship this year. All four rounds would be murderous. Round one would be murderous because it's a bad matchup. Round two, reigning champs. Round three, whoever survives the other side of the bracket, likely Dallas in our opinion. And then you go to a finals. To me, if you just have to paint a team's championship run right now, I think the Wolves have the hardest run. I think the team that probably got the biggest shaft is the Knicks because the way this was playing out, man, going into the last few days, they could still have ended up two and played the Pacers or the Magic. Like, mm. you could have got one of those. Instead, you're going to get either Philly or Miami. And yeah. whoever – look, if Miami beats Philly in Philly, like, if they pull that off, that's going to be like, oh, damn, here we go. Here come the Heat. And that's who, and the Knicks Heat, you know, history is that would be an incredible series, man. If those two teams matched up, or you get Philly with a, you know, rejuvenated Joel Embiid, and they're playing great coming in. He's got some new pieces around him. You got a yeah. co-star next to him that's not going to fade. I, I really believe Maxie's going to be great. So I think the Knicks, man, they, they, it's like they killed themselves to get to two, <laughs> and, and it could have worked out better if they ended up somewhere else. So I think. I think, like you said about Minnesota, you know, as a three, that's what you get. This team that's giving you trouble and is playing their best they have all year. I'd say the same thing about the Knicks, man. That's not necessarily what you were hoping to get at the two spot. And it looked like it could have been something totally different a week ago. You know what? Salute to uh, Tom Thibodeau, though. This is such a Tibbs move. Like, don't worry about gaming the system. Just win. Just keep winning. <laughs> you got to play yeah. your guys 45 minutes. Keep so winning. I said, man, a little while ago, just, just win and let, let everything fall in place, man, and just see what happens. But the mentality of win, win. We're going to win. Guys are available. We're going to win. We're going to go out and play to win. We're not going to even take that mentality of trying to, like, facilitate an easier way. I just think it's a dangerous thing in sports to do that. Well, I'll tell you what, the, the Knicks, more than any team in the NBA, grind you down. And the 76ers, while I think that they are more talented and have an unstoppable player in Joel Embiid in that series, he's susceptible to being grinded down. So I do think that there is going to be a level of that of, hey, he's a guy, he's got a big engine, so he can wear down over the course of the game. And you just got to, over the course of a seven-game series, chip away at him, chip away, and you might, and he's, boss, by the way, fresh back from injury, so it's not like he is mid-season form or what have you. You, you got to test that, and the Knicks are going to be as good as any team at testing that, but I agree. Tough draw, man, when you saw the other options that were on the board for you. All right, let's take a break. On the other side, another question. Who has the most pressure heading into the playoffs? Legs and I have not prepped each other for this one, so I'm very excited no. to hear what, what your answer is, because I have very specific answers we'll get to, but first, 
Let's talk about the game time app. It is Monday. We have playoffs coming up. If you're trying to grab playoff tickets for your favorite team, head on over to the game time app. They have all of those great features. I always talk about flash deals, zone deals, last minute tickets. You can set alerts for a specific ticket and see if the price drops so that if the price drops last minute, you get a little notification and you could purchase them right away. It's easy to find and buy tickets for every kind of event in your area. So if you're not trying to check out a playoff game this weekend, maybe your team's on the road, but you want to catch a concert or a festival or something else, just go on there as well. You can check it out. They also have the all in pricing button. You click that and there's no surprise when you check out with hidden fees. So download the game time app, create an account and use code all NBA, A L L M B A for $20 off your first purchase terms apply. But again, create an account and redeem code with all NBA, A-L-L, NBA for $20 off. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. All right, back here, final segment of the all NBA show, Adam Rez and Tim Legler. So who has the most pressure heading into the playoffs? As things stand right. right now, who's your number one? All right, here's what I'm gonna do. Here's how I wanna do this. Uh, I wanna do East and West, break it down and keep them separate, okay? So okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna run through this quickly in the East because I think some I'm gonna eliminate and you, when I get done my statement, tell me if you disagree. Okay. I'm gonna eliminate okay. zero pressure on certain entities and that'll get us down to who I think. I think there's three, okay. three okay. entities, whether player or team, with pressure in the Eastern Conference because I think there's zero obviously on Atlanta, zero on Chicago, zero yep. on Cleveland, zero on Orlando. Would you agree with all that? Yeah, Cleveland maybe has a little bit more because they, they thought they should be better than they are. But at this very moment, it's hard to put too much expectation on them. So, yes, I agree. There you go. And I, you just said the key word. I think, I think there's, 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 there's a few words that we're talking about here. Expectation is clearly the number one word when you talk about pressure. Because without it, there isn't any. So let's, it's, it's expectation. Yeah. I think the other two words, interest. Interest. Like how much are people really paying attention and then reaction? How much reaction are these guys going to get if they don't come through or they don't play well? And that's why I've eliminated those four immediately from the mix. I'll, I'll give you another one. I don't think there's any on Indiana at all. I, I, I was going to say they would go on that list for me as well. Okay, so there you go. There's five right off the bat. I don't think there's any on Miami. I don't think anybody has expectations for Miami this year. So I'm going to throw them in the trash bin. So now – we're, here we go. We only got a few left, four teams left, race or entities. Okay. Okay. Joel Embiid to me has a I lot agree. of pressure on him, and here's why. Here's why. And people might say, "Wait a second, the guy's been hurt, this, that, and the other." No, well, no, he's back now, man. He just averaged thirty points and nine rebounds in a five-game winning streak. Now I know he limped off the court, but he came back and he finished the game. The assumption is he's fine going into this series. Okay, he's got this, this. He's got a real team next to him. He's got a real co-star next to him. You got to beat if it's the Knicks. You got to go beat the Knicks. I'm sorry, you need to beat the Knicks if you're Joel Embiid. So there's pressure on him to perform because he has not been great in the postseason at times when they needed him to be. Sometimes he has, sometimes he hasn't. He needs to win that series, assuming he's healthy. You got to go beat the Knicks. Okay, and at that point, now you're headed to the conference finals against the Boston if you win another round. Okay, so I think there's a lot on him. I don't hold think on, let me, let me, let me, let me, hold on, okay, hold on, let me, let me, let me yep. put, add to that because here's the thing. Yes, he was, he's been hurt and he's just coming back and they're a lower seed, but here's how I would look at it. Joel Embiid's 30 years old. He's not getting younger. You're at the point right now where you're kind of at the apex of, of what you should expect. And the path is not that hard. I'm not saying it's easy. The Celtics look really, really tough, but the Knicks are shorthanded. They've been banged up. The Bucs obviously have lost something over the course of the season, and now Giannis is banged up. Cleveland and Orlando are not great teams. Indiana is not a great team. So you look at it and you say, yes, you're, th you know, yes, some things have gone wrong for you this year, but the path isn't that hard. Next year, right. I expect the path to be harder. I don't think Good things point. get easier next year. So I look at it and I say, yes, Embiid has yet to make Good. a conference finals and make the finals win a championship. That pressure is there as well. But just make a conference finals. This to me feels like his best chance he will get to do that. Excellent. I'm glad you agree with me because I think it's pretty clear cut. Um, now let's talk about these top three teams in the Eastern Conference. Okay, let's let's go with Milwaukee. Okay. There's a, there, there, there's a variety of ways to look at the pressure here. For me, there's one that's got significantly more pressure on anybody else, and that's Damian Lillard. I think he's got far more pressure on him than Doc Rivers. Now, this might end up being a bad decision by Doc Rivers to take this job if they flame out. <laughs> yeah, he'll get hit because he's had some other playoff failures, and, and they're going to pile on at that point. But I'm sorry, man. Damian Lillard played 11 years in Portland, mostly on irrelevant teams. 
He he came here with the expectation to win a title this year. And yeah. he's been very good this year. He hasn't been sensational. He's going to have to outplay some star players in this in this run for the Bucs. There's going to be nights he has to be the best player on their team. That's why you brought him in there, to be that. And to be great, by the way, in close games, which the Bucs haven't been. So I think if they lose in the first round, let's just say, and, he, and he's just okay or up and down, I think Damian Lillard's going to take the biggest hit, bigger than Doc. Bigger than Giannis. I think it's I think it's Lillard. I think he's got more pressure on him than anybody else with the Bucs. What do you think? I I agree with you about the about him having the most pressure on the Bucs. And here's the thing: we've seen this a lot. And I don't blame Dame. This is not a critique. But when players ask out of wherever they are, they want to go to a contender. It actually, that's when you have the most pressure on you. Cause you said, I need a better situation. They sent you to a better situation. Well, now the pressure is on you. So I, I agree with you that I think of all the Bucks players, he would have the most. The problem is I just have no faith in the Bucks right now. My faith is completely gone. So your expectation level is down, which, which is low. that's, that's yeah. the big word. And so therefore the pressure is diminished in your mind a little bit. You're probably, you are probably right about that because to me, that's it. That is the essence of what pressure is. It's expectation. And living up to it, right? And so if you don't think it's as high, then the pressure meter for them, not as significant. Um, now let's talk about the, the the top two, the Knicks. I had somebody try to tell me that this morning how much pressure Jalen Brunson's under. I couldn't disagree more with that. I think Jalen Brunson, first of all, I expect him to, to play exceptionally well, whoever they play. I just don't think you can get this guy off his game at this point. Like I'm as confident mm -hmm. after Jokic and Luka, I'm as confident in him as anybody else in the postseason of what he's going to play like every night. I really believe it. But here's the thing. Nobody views their team as that. I think the pressure on Brunson is more about, hey, man, I've ascended to a place. I might be fourth in MVP voting. I got to now go play that way in a playoff series and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Embiid or go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a Giannis and a Lillard or a Tatum and those guys. I've got to be able to play on their level, even if we lose. It's more for me about an individual kind of pound the gavel moment for Jalen Brunson than it is about team expectations. If they lose in the first round to the Sixers, I just don't think they're going to get crushed for that. I really don't. Yeah, that's why I don't think that they I, they wouldn't be on my list. Although, like we said with Joel Embiid, everything feels like Oh, oh, the Knicks, they have a great team. They're going to be great for forever. This is also, unfortunately, they drew the 76ers, but this should also be the most down the Eastern Conference is top to bottom, you know, going forward. So they, if you can get by the 76ers, or by the 76ers you're primed to make a run to the conference finals. And then, you know, let's see a, a really iconic Knicks-Celtics matchup. So I agree with you. Nobody would really hammer them too hard, I don't think, if they lost. But at the same time, it might be their best chance as well. You never know. And so that leaves the Celtics here. Yeah, and that's by far to me the most pressure of any entity in the Eastern Conference. You can't, you cannot cough this up. You're so much better than every other team in the Eastern Conference. You have to make the final. Now, I think there are people who are going to say, no, 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 that's not enough. You go 64 and 18 and you got home court advantage in the finals, you got to win the whole damn thing, no matter who you play, even if it's Denver. I think there's going to be people that are going to put that level of pressure on them. I mean, I think for me, I want to see how the first three rounds go to, to be able to see what I think would happen in that series. But for me, it's really just about getting to the finals. You can't lose prior to that. They have more pressure on them based on the year they have, the amount of talent they have, the versatility, the depth, everything. To me, that's the most pressure of anything in the East, the Boston Celtics collectively. For starters, if you don't make it out of the East, you won 64 games this year. You could win 82 games next year. I don't want to hear anything about the Boston Celtics. If they don't, if they don't make it out of the East, it means their regular season next year is null and void. Don't tell me anything about it. Just wake me up when the playoffs begin. But I agree with you about winning. Again, there's never a down year in the NBA legs. There's never an easy champion it's going always hard to win but this should be the easiest path that they get of all of their title window you know years this might be the easiest one given some of the injury concerns in the eastern conference so i'm with you you got to win it i will say if they don't win it this year if they go to the finals and lose i still think that they could bounce back their team is young enough their players are young enough and i i so I do think there is a world where they could lose this and win next year or, or what have you and in that way maybe the pressure is a little bit less than than you might think 
But nonetheless, it's open for them, and this is the best chance they've ever had, so they got to get it done. All right, let's go to the West. All right, I'm going to give you four teams I'm going to remove from the equation entirely. I don't think there's any pressure whatsoever on the Sacramento Kings, the New Orleans Pelicans, Minnesota Timberwolves, or Oklahoma City Thunder. I don't think there is pressure because the expectations are not going to be there. I just don't. And I think, look, for Minnesota, for Minnesota, you know, you lose to Phoenix with all that star talent, people are not going to crush you for that. They're just not. And if you win that series, man. I'm just telling you, they're not going to get beat up like you think, man. Oh. They're just not. The, the, expectation, the, the expectation and the interest are not at that level for Minnesota that they're going to be, get beat up like that. They're just not. They're not. I man. think you're right about that. You're looking at this almost exclusively from expectation, which I understand. But here's the bigger thing. The Timberwolves, they have one Western Conference Finals appearance in their history. They don't have a lot of playoff wins in their entire franchise history. This is the one of, if not the best team they've ever had. So if you lose in the first round, even if even if it was a bad matchup, it's been 30 years, Legs. Those poor Timberwolves fans would not look at that and say, yeah, well, we drew a bad one and nobody's going to say this or that. They would look at it and say, this was our best chance yeah. ever and you, you know didn't what? make it out of the first round. I hear you. Here's the problem with it, man. The Western Conference is is so bizarre oh, yeah. in that, in that the, the, what we're talking about, these teams that underachieve in the regular season – that have rosters built the way they are. And now you get to play those teams, even though you're a three seed in normal year, you're a three six, man. That that you probably should be a prohibitive favorite. They're not, they're no. not. And we I, I think most people are gonna pick the Suns to win that series. And there's yeah. a reason for that because the expectations are just not there. And the interest and the reaction yeah. to minutes, it's just not. Now, maybe in a couple of years, if Anthony Edwards ascends to that level where he's an MVP candidate and they win. 58 to 60 games, and now it's like, damn, okay, he's arrived on that level, and they have one of the top records in the league. That's different. I don't think they're there yet with that stuff. I just don't. So I don't think there is any. In Oklahoma City, you got five dudes under 25 years old. No pressure. You're the one seed. Great. Had a great year. Listen to all the different scenarios. I'm telling you right now, if they end up playing the Lakers in the first round, a lot of people are picking the Lakers to win that series in a 1-8 matchup. Zero pressure. Now, I agree. By that, listen, it's all gravy. If you advance, great. And now we can really start to talk about you next season. But there's no expectation. Nobody's getting crushed. Shea Gilgis Alexander is not getting talked about on talk radio for three days if they lose that series. Look, actually, as an eight seed, the Lakers will get talked about more for losing that series as an eight than, than the than the Thunder will as a one. That's just the way it is. So that's why I think. Sacramento, New Orleans, Denver, Minnesota, for me, I don't think there's any in terms of the post fallout from losing in the first round. I just don't think it's there. So that gives us, that takes us to some other teams. I still think there's some for Golden State because of what we're always talking about, which is what happens next. Yeah, it's almost over. Ramifications, if they don't even make it out of the play-in, what are the ramifications? So there's pressure there associated with that for some of the individual entities in their organization. What do you, what do you think about that as far as Golden State goes? I, I agree with you on Golden State. Just because it's almost over, this does, does feel like the last round. You don't know. Is Steph ask out? Does, does Draymond moves out? Like, there's going to be changes. It feels like the last hurrah. And if it goes out with a whimper without making it even to the playoffs or making a run, it's not the biggest. It's not the end of the world. This is a great team no matter what happens. But it would be sad to go out that way. You kind of want one last little hurrah from them. The number All one right, team, what about, though. What about the Lakers? Lakers? Uh, the Lakers should always have pressure because they went all in on LeBron James and Anthony Davis. So every year they, I, I mean, you go that in and you trade that much future and everything. You just, you have no, you have to win. So I, I agree. <laughs> they should have pressure. And just in general, again, tying it all together <laughs> in terms of the reaction, everything LeBron James does is overly yeah. scrutinized a good or bad. Yeah. So it's That's going to be picked apart. Whatever happens, that's going to be picked apart whenever they lose for days. And so that's clearly there's always going to be pressure on a team that LeBron James is on. All right, Phoenix. Number one to me. And Number one. Any more? Okay, so more collectively or Kevin Durant? Oh, I think the Suns more collectively because, again, they traded their entire future for this team. And if you go out sad, first round or whatever, it's just like, hey, what did we do? Our future is not bright. Our present was supposed to be bright. And if you don't make it far enough to make you believe, to me, it's more them. But I do agree that it's close. Kevin Durant is right there as well because his post-Warriors era would have continued yeah. to be disappointing. 
I think I think what it comes down to is I'm a big believer that not every single ring is is worth the same. Of course. And I, yeah. I do believe that in my heart. And I think if he could have gotten it done in Oklahoma City, I would have carried more weight than the two he got in Golden State. If he gets one here with this group, carries more weight. Because you assume in doing so, he's going to be their best player all, all around. I think people would assume that. So if they were to make a run and win a title, he's probably going to be the finals MVP. And, but he did it with a not only a team that hadn't won and gotten over the hump, a franchise that's never done it. It's similar to what LeBron James did in Cleveland. So that, I think that it carries a lot of weight, man. Having said that, look, he's a two-time champion, two-time finals MVP. He probably sleeps like a baby at night no matter how it goes. I get it. But in terms of the way we view him, historically, he could add a lot if he were to pull this off of Phoenix. So I think it's more on him actually even than collectively as the group. Um, all right, Dallas. Who, who's got the most pressure in Dallas? I'll tell you what I believe. It's Kyrie Irving. I I, I know what Luke is going to yeah. do. I know what Luke is going to do. You can pencil it in right now. Luca's going to be dominant. He's going to be great. He's going to show up in, under pressure. He's going to be Nobody perfect. Nobody higher on Luca than legs, man. Kyrie has been great in pressure situations. He has. I mean, that's yeah. a big part of why we were kind of enamored by him. Good, incredible talent. He's also been great when when his team needed him to be when he was in Cleveland. But now, you're, if you're Luca and you have these pieces around you and you got Kyrie playing at this level, you're counting on Kyrie to be that special dude certain nights in, in these series, in these games and within these series. And if you do it, you can make a legitimate run at the Nuggets. And that's why I think there's more pressure on Kyrie than Luca, and more pressure on, on himself than there is even on the organization. What do you think about Dallas? I think Luca has more pressure than Kyrie just because okay. Kyrie is the sidekick. And Luca, to me, this is the year where, and it's not fair, but this is the year where if Luca does not get over the hump, at least back to the conference finals, but probably to the finals, people will turn on him. And I know Mass fans were looking, they want the MVP, they want all these different things, and I get it. But I'm telling you, there's a moment in every player superstar's arc where if they haven't won by then, the conversation turns to, well, then it, it almost becomes a weight. Oh, you're so good, but you're not a winner. And I just think this is the year for Luca, fair or not. And I actually think it's not fair, but fair or not, I think this is the year that turns for him if they don't at least make a conference finals. But even then, you probably will still have some people, if they don't make it to the finals, that would start to talk about that. So I just think that he has more pressure than Kyrie, even if I understand the perspective you're sharing about Kyrie. Okay. And I, I just feel like if they don't, it won't be because of Luca. And I don't think we'll be talking about like I think Luca was going to do everything he has to do. Like I think he's going to put up the type of numbers and play the way he has to in a way that you're like, man, what more could this dude do? And so then we start looking to other pieces. And I think Kyrie would be the first place you would look. But look, I have no reason to think Kyrie won't play play great. I mean, he's been, he's he, he's capable of doing that. I don't he's not like this isn't a James Harden situation where I wonder, like, man, can he handle the pressure? I don't feel that way about Kyrie, so I expect him to play great for them. And if that, and if he does, I think it's going to play out the way I think, which is Dallas playing Denver in the conference finals. All right, that leaves only two teams, the Clippers and the Nuggets. So how about the Clippers? They have pressure for sure, uh, just because their roster is expensive. We're, we're, we're past the halfway point of this experiment, right? The Kawhi, Paul George, yeah. we're over the halfway point, and they still haven't one so for me they carry a pressure but i almost feel like they're post pressure like they've already come up short in their best opportunities so that's the only reason i feel that way i look at them in this way i think uh, i i personally feel like some of the expectations have been tempered because of the way these things have gone here for the last couple of months like Kawhi not being fully healthy not they're not playing great they're playing much better earlier in the year after they acquired Harden. they're not playing great right now I think that a lot of people aren't expecting James Harden to be great, aren't expecting necessarily Paul George to be great. Uh, Kawhi, I don't know that has a lot of pressure on him because of what he already did in Toronto and winning that championship with that group on a one-year rental, and he goes in there and wins a championship for the Toronto Raptors, and he's won, he's, he's won with San Antonio as well. I don't know that he has the, the personal pressure. I think it's the group, and I think the expectations have been lowered for this group to where – Yes, it's definitely going to be a talking point because of who it is. These are Hall of Fame yeah. players. I get it. But I don't think it's going to have the legs that it will with some of these other situations. And that brings us to the Denver Nuggets. And you're no better person to ask. To what, what extent do the Denver Nuggets have pressure going into this postseason? I think they have pressure in terms of the outcome has a wide – like if you win another title, that's really big for you. I would almost call it more opportunity. If you're a back-to-back -back champion, that's different than being a champion. If you're a two-time – 
you know, champion. That's different than being a one-time champion historically. So I think they have opportunity to rise. I don't know if they feel the same pressure as some of these other teams because they're coming off the title. Um, but nonetheless, it's, so for me, it's less pressure and more opportunity. They have a golden opportunity and they should view this opportunity as one that they can take advantage of. I agree with that. And I think the pressure falls in like the level of expectation to not just be a team that won a championship, Right to be it to be like one of these great teams that we talk about historically. You've you've got this window of opportunity in their prime with this core continuity with this group, the starting five in particular. Like th this is your moment to seize to take advantage and win as much as you possibly can because you just don't know what direction things can go. Injuries, trades, free agent decisions. There's all kinds of stuff. But right now, you clearly are a team that can do it. You've got a guy that's probably going to win his third MVP. And so you you want to go down when this is talked about 20, 25, 30 years from now as, man, remember that Nuggets run? Not remember that Nuggets title. And that, yeah. I think, is where the pressure comes from. Uh, it's yeah. just trying to add on to what your legacy could be. And there's an incredible opportunity to do it right now. The 2010s were not about the Dallas Mavericks. They were not about the San Antonio Spurs. And they were not about the Toronto Raptors, even though they won. The years they oh, won, they were about that. Won, right? Good point. They were, right. they were about the Miami Heat and the Golden State Warriors because those two teams had eras, not seasons. And I think Correct. that's kind of what you're talking about. So if Denver manages to go back-to-back -back and win one, the 2020s, they will have to be talked about when you talk about the 2020s. Not mentioned, not footnoted but it'd be, you'd start there with them. So that's a huge opportunity. And for Jokic in particular. Um, all right, that does it. We went long today. So we're going to have to move our thing, the storylines that we'll most remember about the regular season. We might have to move that to tomorrow's show and get to something else. We did have one super chat though, Legs, and it was somebody that wanted to, I told you so. It is a big PHNX Suns fan, Psycho Blue SFXT. And he says, since Legs isn't up on his Lovecraft, which is by the way, an author, after PHNX, Finished seven and three in the hardest last 10 ever. And he put that in quotes. And most wins versus 500 teams since January. B ball Cthulhu only has three words for the three point shootout legend. Well, well, well. LC Bird. So he wants to say they went, the Suns went seven and three in the toughest stretch of the year. And he wants to, well, actually, you. That, that's fine, man. I, I hear you. I get it. You know, one thing, one thing, I, one thing I'll promise. Anybody yeah. and some people that are you know watching this, what we've been doing all year, right? Maybe new to some of you know my personality yeah. type, my content. I own everything I say. I tell you right now, and I'm not look. I'm not dismissing the Suns' chances. You can't deny they were a hot mess. They're playing better. Yeah. They're playing their best with this group since they all put it together. It's a good sign going in. Now let's see, and we'll talk about that series as we get later into the week. I can't wait. We're going to be breaking down all of these series here this week, later this week. Tomorrow's show, we're going to be breaking down tomorrow's games, which are the first playoff game, the play-in tournament. I can't wait to get into the, uh, all the details of those and get Legs' prediction for them. Right now, our MVP. Who did Legs settle on for the MVP? We recorded, we recorded this like five days ago, and I wonder, would your answer have changed if we would have waited until today to record it, Legs? No, it wouldn't. Not today. No, it wouldn't change. But yeah. if you went another, if you went another three or four days, maybe, man. Yeah. There was <laughs> this particular player definitely felt some warm breath on his neck. There's no yeah. question about it. But I don't think he quite got a hold of that jersey in the back stretch. Well, our official predictions are up right now. You can see them on our YouTube channel. We've been doing these extra ones. So if you want to know who we picked for all the end of season awards, check that out. We'll have more specialty content throughout the week. But for now, we are done. We'll see you tomorrow. Like the mayor.